So let me just start off by saying that I have like a personal affinity for the book of Daniel. It was very important in my uh, salvation because through the book of Daniel, I saw the evidence of Bible prophecy. I saw the evidence of scripture. So it's probably one of my top favorite books to teach. Um, and so I'm excited about teaching it in the next 13 weeks. Um, about the book of Daniel is the book of Daniel is one of the most important books to understand if you want to understand Bible prophecy. Because what the book of Daniel does, it connects the Old Testament and the New Testament. And um, uh, what the book of Daniel tells us is that God is in control over the nations. There's not a thing that's happening in the world that God's surprised about. There's not a thing that's happening in the world that God uh, is not uh, in charge of. The, the God, God allows things to happen, but God also changes things. He gives, he gives people the rulers that they deserve. We'll see this in the book of Daniel. Uh, and so the other part of the book of Daniel is that we have what's called the timeline of the Messiah. It's the blueprint of Bible prophecy. So it's kind of like if you ever thought about a, the, the blueprint of a building and you want to see like how the, how the building is arranged, where the rooms are, how everything's being put together, you would look at a blueprint. Well, in the same way, the book of Daniel is just like that. There are several blueprints in the book of Daniel that once you, once you put them on the, on the surface, you can really understand how things are transitioning in the world that has been blueprinted in the book of Daniel. Uh, and uh, one of the themes in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2 and through the, uh, Daniel chapter 7, is the kingdom of God. The one, that one day, the kingdom of God will... will overtake the kingdom of men. God will establish the kingdom through the messianic, through the messianic king. Uh, but all of this makes Daniel a target for the critics. Because one of the things in the book of Daniel is an amazing prophetic accuracy. So accurate that the book of Daniel actually predicts to the day that Jesus would be cut off from the nation of Israel. So accurate to the day that Jesus, it says that after the Messiah is cut off, the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed and the temple would be destroyed. All these were written about 600 years before the event. By the way, that's what Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks of Daniel, that's what so thoroughly convinced me about the book of Daniel and about, about the Bible. Once I understood Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel, I was blown away. And to this day, I'm still blown away. And I love sharing with it. I love teaching about the book of Daniel because I really believe that if someone's an unbeliever, someone says, show me the evidence, that if they took the time and they studied the book of Daniel, they would see the evidence and they would be convinced. And, and I've seen this happen over and over again. Atheists who studied the book of Daniel, who became believers because of the evidence that they were overwhelmed with. And so I hope, I, I hope to share that. So the book of Daniel is, is, is critics. Now, it's important to understand the, 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 the time period of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is taking place uh, between 605 B.C. and 530 B.C. Daniel chapter 1 is 605 B.C. And the end of, da the, uh, end of Daniel, Daniel chapters 10, 9, 10, and 11, I mean, uh, Daniel, Daniel's 10, 11, and 12 are taking place around 530 B.C. during the third year of the reign of Cyrus the Great. Uh, uh, and so what we see in Daniel taking place is we see a conflict of kingdoms. Daniel is right at the time of a transition of world kingdoms. Uh, just so you kind of understand like the, the teams here, there's Babylon is on one side, and then there's Assyria and Egypt on the other side. Nebuchadnezzar is Daniel's, I mean, is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's father. And he comes to power in 621. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but the Babylon that we're speaking of here is really considered Neo-Babylon. That means New Babylon. Because there was a Babylon that was a kingdom prior to this Babylon. Even though this is 2,600 years ago, there was an even more ancient Babylon. A lot of people are familiar with that, the, one of the famous kings. He's known as Hammurabi. Hammurabi lived about 1700 B.C., so that's almost 1,100 years before this Nebuchadnezzar. This is actually considered Nebuchadnezzar II. There was another Nebuchadnezzar. So Babylon is an ancient kingdom with ancient history. Uh, 
And there's another kingdom to the north of Babylon called Assyria. And so these two kingdoms were constantly like fighting for control. Babylon used to control Assyria. Then Assyria eventually came to power and started controlling Babylon. And so this, this, this conflict was going on. And so, um, and so what happened was is Nebu Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nabopolassar, uh, he comes to power in 621 B.C., but let me kind of go back in history. If you kind of remember in the book of Isaiah, uh, after Hezekiah is healed, uh, Hezekiah has visitors from Babylon. And what does Hezekiah do to these visitors? Does anybody remember? He shows them everything. He shows them his treasure house. He shows them everything. And then, and this is, the, and this is king, uh, this is a king of Babylon or a leader, of, a prince of Babylon under Assyrian. And so, but they're already plotting a rebellion against Assyria to the north. And so, Hezek Isaiah says to Hezekiah, the day is coming when all your treasures will be taken into this, into this land. And even your offspring will be taken into this land. This is a foreshadowing of what was going to happen in Daniel's day. Um, because Babylon eventually overtakes Assyria to the north under the leadership of Nabopolassar. He became sick king in 621 B.C. And so what he does is he rebels against Assyrian authority. And so here's like, this, this map is basically a map of the Assyrian kingdom. And so Babylon is south here. Assyria is north here. Uh, Nineveh, remember, that's the city that, that Jonah went to. Uh, that's the, that's the capital city, or one of the cap three. There's several capital cities of, of, of Assyria. But Babylon grows in power and eventually overtakes As, uh, uh, Nineveh and, uh, and the Assyrian kingdom. Now, what happens is uh, he sacks, in 612 B.C., Nabopolassar, that's Nebuchadnezzar's father, he sacks Nineveh. So the Ninevites, the Assyrians, they move their capital to Haran, uh, and then in 610 B.C. he sacks Haran. And then finally they move their capital to the city of Carchemish. Uh, and so if you look on your, if you look on your map, uh, you can actually see this is, uh, Carchemish is over here. Uh, Haran is over here. Uh, and Nineveh is over there. So, so he, the kingdom is moving. Now what happens is Assyria cries out for help to Egypt. So Egypt sends Pharaoh Necho to help, um, to help the Assyrians during the time of 605 B.C. And it's during this time that King Josiah decides that he's not going to allow Pharaoh Necho to go through uh, Judah. And so he basically uh, has a military conflict with Pharaoh Necho. And Pharaoh Necho kills Josiah. Uh, and then he goes on, and then he's, he's eventually defeated along with uh, Assyria at the Battle of Carchemish. And that battle was for control of the Middle East about 605 B.C. And so in that same year, Nabopolassar, he dies. And his son, who is a general, Nebuchadnezzar, takes, takes control of the, uh, of the Babylonian army. And... Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is his son. He succeeds him. And so on his way back to Babylon to take control of Babylon, Jerusalem ends up surrendering to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, now, because prior to this, Jerusalem was aligned with Egypt because Egypt was coming through. They, they, uh, they kill Josiah and they install their own king. Uh, Eloiakim, who then, then changed the name of Jehoiakim, okay? Uh, and what happens is, is that when Nebuchadnezzar defeats the Egyptians, and he's, he comes through, and he basically claims Jerusalem, and Jerusalem submits to him, and Jerusalem ends up su submitting hostages, okay? These hostages are the royal, of royal descent. One of them is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are hostages. They're, they're descendant from the, king, the kingly line of, uh, of Judah. And this kind of goes back to the prophecy that Isaiah said. Isaiah said, one day your descendants, Hezekiah, will be eunuchs in the house of Babylon. And so Daniel, um, a lot of people are disappointed by the fact, but Daniel is a eunuch. He, you know, he, he's under the chief of the eunuchs. We'll talk more about that in a, in, in a few minutes. But... So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are hostages. 
and they're going to be taken into Babylon to be schooled in the finer points of Babylonian uh, authority and teaching. Uh, don't realize, but, but the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem three times. In 605 BC, the Babylonians attack Jerusalem. Jerusalem surrenders. They submit hostages, such as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And basically the way it works is the same way it works today. You submit a hostage. Every, you, you're, as long as you behave, you're hostage. You're the one that you love, who's now your, who's my, everything's going to be okay. Just, just don't, don't rebel, don't do anything. So that worked for about uh, seven or eight years. And then Jerusalem rebelled against Babylon. So what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He came back, okay? And he took more hostages. And uh, that was in 597 B.C. And one of those hostages was Ezekiel. Ezekiel was taken into Babylon. And then again, uh, Jerusalem rebels again a third time. And this time, Nebuchadnezzar comes again, but this time he destroys the city. He destroys the city, tears down the walls, destroys the temple, and uh, kills uh, most of the people, okay? A few survived. Jeremiah, for example, uh, what survives and so forth. But, and so these are the three separate events that, that involve the Babylonian attack. So finally, the third time the Babylonians had it, and they destroy the, uh, destroy the city of, uh, of Jerusalem. So, but Daniel is taken captive the first time in 605 B.C. That's when Daniel's taken captive. And San Daniel's there as a young boy, and he's the first four chapters of the book of Daniel are during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And actually, most people don't realize this, but the fourth chapter of Daniel is actually written by Nebuchadnezzar from beginning to end. The whole fourth chapter of Daniel is written by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so, so Daniel uh, is taken, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're taken hostages into the land of Babylon. So, um, in these kingdoms and conflicts, so Egypt was coming to aid Assyria in 609 B.C., and they were defeated. Josiah tried to stop Egypt. Josiah is killed, and Babylon defeats Egypt in 605 B.C. And so now Babylon is, the nation of Babylon is mas are, are masters of the whole Middle East. And so this is the same Babylon that's in Iraq today, the same, the same uh, characters that we see uh, happening in, in events. So, uh, but it's important to understand some of the other events that took place that, that are behind the book of Daniel. One is called Josiah's Revival. So if you read through the 1st Kings and 2nd Kings Chronicles, you'll see over and over again, there's kings that are pretty wicked, and they're totally against the God of Israel, uh, and there's kings that are good. And there's only a, there's a, and the kings that are good tend to be in the minority, and the kings that are compared to the kings who are wicked. So some of the most wicked kings uh, are like the son, the sons of the righteous kings. Like Manasseh is a descendant of Hezekiah, one of the best kings. So his son Manasseh was one of the worst kings. Uh, uh, Ammon was a was a bad king. Josiah was one of the best kings. But he was a son of Ammon. So, so we see this happening over and again. That's one of the principles in scriptures that you could see is, is the influence of the fathers, the influence of the leaders uh, uh, on, on their kids. So Josiah, for example, he becomes king when he's eight years old. And, uh, and he has the influence of the priests around him. Then when Josiah is 18 years old, they find the book of the law. And so Josiah at 18 years old, so if you think of 18-year-olds, okay, what happens? Josiah sits there, and the book of the law that was discovered is read out loud. And what does Josiah do? He takes every word to heart. And he, say, he realizes the judgment that's going to come upon the land because of the sins of the land. So Josiah has a national Passover, because Israel hadn't been doing that under the, under the wicked kings of his, uh, uh, his forefathers. And, the, and, the, and the, law, the law was actually hidden because uh, some of these kings would actually, were trying to destroy the law and burn the law, so the priesthood hid the law. So it was, when Josiah was old enough, it was actually discovered. And so this takes place in 
Josiah's day. Josiah is 18 years old. Josiah dies when he's about 39. Uh, but Josiah is a very righteous king. Josiah takes the law very seriously. Josiah seeks out all the idols and he destroys all the idols. He, uh, he, I mean, prior to him, a lot of the kings would kind of like wink, wink at, at the idols. Like, come on, just don't be so public about it. But Josiah took it very seriously. He destroyed the idols. He, he, he burned them. He did everything he could to try to keep the law. And so there was a revival in Josiah's day. And so uh, Josiah's right-hand man was Jeremiah the priest. Uh, so in 605 B.C., just to kind of give you an idea, jo uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel are, are all contemporaries. Daniel's about 14 to 15 years old when he's taken captive into Babylon. And while Daniel's 14 to 50 years old, Ezekiel's about 22 years old. Uh, Jeremiah is about 36 years old. They're all in the, they're all in the city of Jerusalem at the, at, at the very same time. So, for example, Daniel chapter 9 refers to the books of Jeremiah. Ezekiel talks about Daniel uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, but they're all seeing the events taking place at, this, at the same time. So this is, and this is, there, and, and so what we see is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are products of Josiah's revival. The revival that takes place in the days of Josiah. So that way when they go into the land of Babylon, because basically you think about four boys, ages 14, 15, 16, it's hard to say the exact age, taken to a foreign land, going to be schooled in all the things of Babylon. So it's not hard to change people's hearts if they don't really have a strong position on what they believe. But these four boys demonstrate to the whole world the power of instilling instruction into kids and the, and the product of that. Like if you, if you teach kids, you instruct kids, the time's going to come when, when, the, when, when they're going to be tested and uh, the, 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 you'll see the product of that, of that, of that schooling. So they're, they're a great example of that. So, so the book of the law is discovered. Uh, so that's kind of like the background uh, of Daniel. Let's look at a couple other information before we get into Daniel chapter 1. Okay, so uh, the date and the authorship of Daniel. Now, one of the things is that there's a lot of critics to the book of Daniel. And there's critics to the book of Daniel because Daniel is such a highly accurate book that people who reject the idea of supernatural authority have a, have a big problem with the book of Daniel. They can't accept the idea that Daniel's prophetic and Daniel writes about things before they happen. So they have to try to explain it, uh, which we'll talk about more in a, in, in a second. But let's look at who attests to the authority of the book of Daniel. So, and and it's, it's sad to say there are Christian seminaries uh, liberal Christian seminaries that say that Daniel didn't write Daniel, that it was Daniel was a, was a, a concoction of the Maccabees and different groups, and Daniel wasn't really. And so all I have to say is that then you're telling me that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about because Jesus says Daniel wrote Daniel. In fact, J Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus himself says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of, by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So Jesus is saying the book of Daniel was written by Daniel because the abomination of desolation is in Daniel chapter 8, it's in Daniel chapter 9, it's in Daniel chapter 11, and it's in Daniel chapter 12. Uh, and so that's a, almost, almost half the book of Daniel. So Jesus is saying it's written by Daniel. Um, and Daniel himself, uh, in Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 and uh, 9, attests that he is the author of the book of Daniel. Uh, uh, so the, the, problem, the problem is is that there are critics to the book of Daniel. And the reason there's critics to the book of Daniel is because they can't accept the supernatural authority. And one of the earliest critics was a guy named uh, uh, Porphyry in, th in the 3rd century A.D., and what he claims, he claims is that the book of Daniel was actually written, uh, was actually written by uh, Maccabees. The Maccabees, which were, who were uh, Jews who, who 
defeated the Greeks, and out of the Maccabees we have the, the, the holiday of Hanukkah. So we don't actually have any of the surviving works of Porphyry. Uh, Porphyry? Porphyry. Uh, we don't have any of his surviving works, but we have Jerome. Now, Jerome was the, the translator who wrote the Latin Vulgate, Vulgate meaning translation. So he translated the Bible from, uh, from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. And, uh, and so he was also, a, Jerome was also an apologist. And so Jerome responds to, the, to Pro, Porphyry's criticisms. And, and, and if you look on page four of the introduction, um, so on, in Jerome's commentary on the book of Daniel, Jerome responds to it. So, um, and so I'll, I'll just read that quote. It says, uh, Porphyry wrote his 12th book against the prophecy of Daniel, denying that it was composed by the person to whom it is ascribed in, his, in, in this title, but rather by some individual living in Judea at the time of Antiochus, who was surnamed Epiphanes. He further alleged that Daniel did not foretell the future so much as he related the past, and lastly, that whatever he spoke up of up until the time of Antiochus contained authentic history, whereas anything that he may have conjured beyond that point was false, inasmuch as he would, have, uh, he would not have foreknown the future. I wish to stress in my preface this fact, that none of the prophets has so clearly spoken concerning Christ as this prophet Daniel. For not only did he assert that he would come, a prediction common to other prophets, but well as he set forth the very time at which he would come. For so striking was the reliability of what the prophet foretold that he could not appear to unbelievers as a predictor of the future, but rather as a narrator of things already past. And that's a quote from Jerome in the 4th century, who's responding to Porf uh, Porphyry. Uh, criticism. Porphyry wrote a, wrote a book uh, attacking Christianity. And it was a 15-volume work entitled Against the Christians. See, it's nothing new, like uh, the attack of against Christianity is nothing new, and Jerome was responding to that. And what Jerome was saying is that Daniel was so accurate, actually the book of Daniel gives us the exact time that Jesus is going to appear in the ninth chapter. And, uh, and again, that was way before uh, any, any, uh, any other uh, writings. Uh, let, me see if, let me see if anybody has any questions. Okay, so the, the Maccabean Jews, who were the Maccabean Jews? The Maccabean Jews were uh, Jews who lived and who were able to uh, defeat the Greek Empire. Uh, the, well, the Greeks, the, the Greeks who were descendants of, um, uh, uh, the Greeks who were descendants of, uh, of Alexander the Great's armies, they had conquered the whole Middle East and they were trying to impose upon Jerusalem that Jerusalem would be uh, uh, a Greek kingdom and a part of the Greek kingdom. And so they tried to remove the, uh, the scriptures and they tried to get the Jews to worship Zeus and so forth. And the Jews rebelled against that in about 168 BC. That's 168 years before Christ. And, and when the rebellion was done, they established a Maccabean kingdom, which is a 100 year kingdom before the Romans came in. And so Porphyry was saying, well, that's that the, the book of Daniel was written during that time. Again, which is completely erroneous. So, so we have two groups. We have the, the people who say that Daniel was written on a, in an early date and the people who say that Daniel was written in a late date. The early date being the time of Daniel. The late date being the, the time of, um, of the Maccabees. So what, uh, what answers do we have to the people who say that? Now again, archaeology and the word usage affirm the book of Daniel. Like you could actually go through the book of Daniel and look at the words. And give you an example is that, so for example, just like we have um, uh, uh, the King James Bible, we can read the King James Bible and we can see what words were used in the King James Bible. And then we can look at other literature that was written in, in that same time period. And we can compare the words and we compare the words that are used in, in the other literature. And we can see that the words that are, written, that are used in the King James Bible match the other words. So we can actually correlate the two time periods. 
We could do the same thing with the book of Daniel. Because we have other writings during Daniel's, during that Babylonian period of time. We have uh, other Babylonian Aramaic writings that we can compare to the book of Daniel. And they match up perfectly. We have Greek words and Persian words that also can compare to the book of Daniel. Um, so that affirms that. And then also we have archaeology, which I'll talk about here in a second. So, but the reason that the late, uh, the, the reason that they want to late date the book of Daniel again is because of the accuracy of the historical events in the book of Daniel and the rejection of the supernatural authority of the book of Daniel. That's the main thing to remember, is that the book of Daniel is so accurate that you have two options when you read the book of Daniel. Either you subscribe to the idea that the book of Daniel is supernatural in its nature or that it was written after the fact because of the accuracy in the book of Daniel, because of the accuracy of events. And so that's why you're going to have people who... Uh, but and the amazing thing is the book of Daniel goes beyond this... The book of Daniel um, transcends the first century. It transcends the second, transcends the third century. It transcends these events, uh, which we'll talk about more in, in, in the coming weeks. So let's just look at where, where Daniel is placed in the scriptures. So the, there's a Jewish Bible. The Jewish Bible is the same has the same exact books as the, the Christian Protestant Bible. The same books that are in the Jewish Bible are the same books in the Christian Bible, okay? The old, in the Old Testament. The Jewish Bible has a different order than the Christian Bible, okay? Because the Christian Bible is based upon the order in, the, in what's called the Septuagint, but the, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So the Jewish uh, division is tripartite. The, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So Daniel is placed in the book in the port, in the third portion called the uh, called the writings the the, the ketubim. Uh, in the Christians, it's included with the major prophets. And one of the purposes, one of the themes, of major themes in the book of Daniel, that that we see flowing throughout the book of Daniel, is that God rules the nations. God's in control. That we don't have to worry about like things not working out the way we think they should work out. So, like, and, and this is just a quote from Daniel chapter 2. It says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge, knowledgeable to those who have understanding. So that's one of the themes. And then the other theme is, is that the kingdom of God is going to one day supersede the kingdoms of men. That God's going to establish His kingdom, which is going to be an everlasting kingdom. Um, and that's why it's, the book of Daniel is so messianic. And you really, it's very hard to understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the book of Daniel. It's kind of like trying to read the second half of a book without reading the first half of a book because there's so many things that you're going to miss out on. And you're like, well, how, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Oh, it's in the book of Daniel. Oh, I, so you have to go back and read that portion of Daniel. That's why the book of Daniel is foundational in understanding Bible, Bible prophecy. And by the way, this is the tomb of Daniel. You can go to Iran today, and you can see. Now, I don't know who wants to take up that challenge, though. But you can go to Iran today, and this is, the, this is called the, the Daniel Mosque. Uh, and it's the traditional location of Daniel's tomb. There's a synagogue. In, the, in better times, there was a synagogue and a mosque in the same, in the same location. And the one unique characteristic about the book of Daniel is actually written in two languages. It's written in Aramaic, and it's written in Hebrew. So Daniel chapters 1 to 2, verse 4, is written in Hebrew. From, from verse 4, the second part of verse 4, to the end of chapter 7, verse 28, it's written in Aramaic. Then and from chapters 8 to chapters 12, it's written in Hebrew again. Now, Aramaic is a lot, is like a sister language to Aramaic is Arabic. So, like, for example, if you saw the movie The Passion of the Christ, which was written in, which was recorded in, uh, in Aramaic portions, people who are Arabic could actually watch it and understand a certain percentage of that movie without reading the, without reading the subtitles because Aramaic is a similar language. Now, Aramaic, uh, the, the, the Jewish letters today that are used in the Jewish alphabet, those are actually Aramaic letters because when the Jews returned from Babylon... No one could actually read the ancient 
well, not, I'm sure there were, could, there were individuals who could read it, but the majority of the population could not read the ancient script of Hebrew. So what they did is they basically used the Aramaic letters for Hebrew. So Hebrew today, the Hebrew letters today are actually Aramaic lettering, which is Babylon, the, Babylonian, the Babylonian alphabet um, that's used. So Daniel chapters 2 to 7 is written in Aramaic. And that would have been, so the, anybody in the Babylonian kingdom could have read Daniel's chapters 2 to Daniel's chapter 7 and understood it because it's written in, it's written in Aramaic. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. So if you kind of want to understand the division of Daniel, if you look at Daniel, Daniel chapters 1 through 6 are mainly historical in context. He's talking about historical events. So Daniel's not organized chronologically. So... For example, Daniel chapter 8 um, is actually written, it actually occurs before Daniel chapter 6. But Daniel's chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 are all very prophetic. So the theme is, pro is a prophetic theme uh, in, in, the second, in the second half of Daniel. Daniel chapters 7 through 12 are prophetic in their context. That's not to say that Daniel chapters 1 through 6 don't have prophetic elements in it, but just like kind of like if you want to understand a, um, a good uh, way of organizing the book of Daniel, the first six chapters are historical. So like, and actually the first four chapters are taking place during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar with Ch Daniel chapter 4 being written by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel chapter 5 is the handwriting on the wall where the king of, the king of uh, Persia defeats Babylon. Daniel chapter 6 is Daniel in the lion's den, where, the, where Darius, uh, Darius the Mede uh, ends up having to throw Daniel into the lion's den. So uh, that's kind of like the, the, order, the order of the, uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, and then there's other, other portions of the book of Daniel, like um, there's uh, in some in, in portions of the book of Daniel are also found in the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha is basically the Greek, um, uh, the, the Greek editions in the Bible. They're not in the Hebrew Bible, they're not in, in, because they're not considered inspired. But they're found in the Apocrypha, so like there's a Daniel chapter uh, 13, uh, the prayer of Azarias, for example, follows Daniel chapter 3 in the Bible, which is a prayer of the three, three men, Bell and the dragon. So there's different stories, Susanna and so forth, that are, that are found in the Apocrypha. Uh, I'm, I'm not covering those stories, but they're, they're in the notes. It talks about the, the subject matter of those stories, but they're not uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, they're only in the Greek version of the Apocrypha, which, is, uh, which, was, which was found in portions of the Greek translation of the Septuagint. Um, so, um, like defend, in defending the book of Daniel to the critics. So one of the most powerful defenses, um, without getting into a lot of detail just, just because of the time, in the book of Daniel, uh, people will say, well, Daniel was included in the third portion of the Jewish scriptures. He, was, he wasn't included as a prophet. And the reason that Daniel wasn't included in the prophets of the Jewish Bible uh, was because Daniel was, from the Jewish perspective, considered an official. He was not called a nabi, which is a prophet. He was considered an official. He was like, uh, like Joseph, just like Joseph came into Egypt and from Egypt, Joseph rose up to be prime minister. Daniel, just like Joseph, becomes prime minister in Babylon, and he becomes prime minister in Persia, and he becomes like an official. So he's like a government official. Um, and so he wasn't called a, uh, he was called a Hakim, which means wise man, not a Nabi. Uh, and the second reason that they attack the book of Daniel is because the critics cannot accept a supernatural element of Daniel and also the rejection of the miracles, such as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the furnace. To them, that's like an impossible, uh, impossible event. Or Daniel in the lion's den. That's another impossible event for them. So, but it's important to understand the, um, the archaeological aspect, which the archaeology, a, archaeological aspect blows away any critics of the book of Daniel. And I'll, I'm going to give a couple here, and I'll, carry, uh, I'll go through it as we... Uh, go, and so one, for example, we have the tomb of Daniel in Iran. But here, if you're looking, this is what's called the Babylonian Chronicle. 
This is a cuneiform, this is written in cuneiform. And what is the Babylonian Chronicle? The Babylonian Chronicle is a clay tablet uh, that records the events of 605 to 594 BC. That's outside of the Bible, okay? That's, this is not a biblical text. This is a Babylonian text that records the events. So what, is it, what does it say? It was first translated in 1956. It's now in the British Museum. The cuneiform text on this clay tablet tells us three things, three main things. Is one that the Battle of Carchemish, the famous battle for world supremacy where Nebuchadnezzar uh, of Babylon defeats Pharaoh Necho. Two, the ascension to the throne of Nebuchadnezzar II, the Chaldean. And third, the capture of Jerusalem on the 16th of March, 598 BC. That's in this text. And that affirms the events that the Bible talks about. Z Ezekiel, for example, what's one of the main events when Ezekiel is taken captive? Uh, after Jerusalem rebels against Babylonian uh, uh, supremacy, Daniel's taken hostage, then the Babylonians have to come back after, after they rebel against uh, uh, Babylonian authority. But here's another amazing uh, archaeological discovery. This is known as the Nabonidus Chronicle. So, just, just to show you how accurate the book of Daniel is. Because, we're, because there are so many manuscripts and so many cuneiform tablets have been found, we're actually able to read f about Babylonian history from the Babylonian perspective. So, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, for example, tells us that Belshazzar was king of Babylon. Now, prior to the discovery of the Nabonidus Chronicle, there was no confirmation that a guy named Belshazzar even existed. So the critics of the Bible, the critics of the book of Daniel said, ah, Daniel didn't know what he was talking about here. This proves that Daniel is a phony, that Daniel's a fake, because he got, he got the, the rulership of Babylon mixed up because there's no record. We know that Nabonidus was the king of Babylon, not Belshazzar. So, that was the case. That was what the critics constantly, constantly uh, attacked. And then, lo and behold, they find the Nabonidus Chronicle. And what is the Nabonidus Chronicle? Nabonidus Chronicle tells us the situation. So, secular history says that, Nab that Nabonidus was the king of Babylon. Daniel says Belshazzar was king. So, critics pointed to this saying Daniel's in error. This, this, cha this changes results. So Sir Henry Rawlinson discovered a cylinder with an inscription in the Euphrates River which cleared the confusion about the king of Babylon. There were two kings of Babylon in Daniel's day, a father and a son. The father, Nabonidus, installed his son Belshazzar as co-regent. Nabonidus spent much of his time in Arabia and when the Persians conquered the city in 539, Belshazzar was killed. Nabonidus was later captured and sent into exile. And this explains the promise of Daniel 5.29. When Daniel is promised, and it says in Daniel 5.29, then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a, a chain of gold around his neck and made him the proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Nabonidus, Belshazzar, and Daniel. So this, this completely silenced the critics of the book of Daniel. And another, uh, another recent discovery was Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz, and there's others, there's more than this. I'm just, just covering this in an inter introduction, okay? Ashpenaz is mentioned in the first chapter of the book of Daniel as master of the eunuchs. The critics say there's no such person ever existed. But recent discoveries affirmed, okay? In the, it's in the Berlin Museum. The Babylonian monument had the following statement. Ashpenaz, master of the eunuchs in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So, again, the critics are silenced over and over again in the book of Daniel because of the complete accuracy of the book. And there's more in the introduction, but just I don't have enough time to go into it because uh, I want to get into Daniel chapter 1.